coming up, the last great power ballad of the 80s, in my opinion. And it almost didn't make it onto the record because the band thought it was just okay. In fact, their exact thinking was uh, that it was really cheesy, even though it rocked harder than most ballads. Well, their label and their management both felt it would be a smash, as did the band's friend John Bon Jovi. So the band recorded it. And it actually ended up being one of their biggest hits. Coming up, the founder, guitarist, and co-writer shares the first-hand account of one of the most chosen songs for the prom uh, of those years. One of the best vocals of that year. The story's coming up on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies. Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, we interview the great artists of the rock era, and you never know from day to day who's gonna be on the show, what's in store. So make sure to subscribe so you never miss out. Make sure to click the bell, all that business. That's just what people tell me. Also, don't forget to check out our exclusive content on Patreon that helps us keep it a daily channel. So I'm excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations. This is where featured artists go deep on their greatest songs and albums. Today, we go behind a song that hit at the end of the 80s into 1990. It's one of the last great power ballads of the hair metal slash glam metal era, though I'd consider today's band more hard rock. I mean, you know, Skid Row has been bundled in with uh, other bands of that time, with the movement that was going on at that time, or really, in this case, at that time, going down, dying down. I'm talking about Dave the Snake Sabo, the guitarist, co-founder, and co-writer of hard rock band Skid Row, and the story of their massive hit, I Remember You. This was written by Dave and Rachel Bolin. This song gives new meaning to the term power ballad because it's a lot more than that. It's a fire-breathing, speaker-blowing, multi-guitar rumbling hard rock extraordinaire of the late 80s that really became the go-to prom theme of the first year of the 90s and beyond. And an incredible vocal by Sebastian Bach. I mean, timeless. Dave and Rachel definitely wrote one for the ages here. A hard rock ballad that has hypnotized generations. Again, just thinking about Sebastian Bach's mind-blowing and soul-expanding vocal on this song, it's just amazing. Combine that with Scotty Hill's absolutely scorching and emotional guitar solo. It just makes the hairs on my neck stand straight on end. 80s magic. Actually, Scotty Hill has a cool tutorial about the solo on YouTube. I'll link to it below. Up next, the story of I Remember You, straight from Dave, including recording the song, had its effect on the culture. They really didn't want to record it. As we get into this interview and find out, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zen AI, where my favorite frames ever. Go design your own pair with digital blue light protection at zenny.com. Here's Snake with the story of I Remember You coming up. And then your third single is I Remember You. And to me, that's like a power ballad on steroids. <laughs> That was a big one, number six on the Billboard Hot 100, number 23 on the mainstream rock chart. But that was a song that was, I think, a lot bigger than even that chart position because it was the song that I remember high school dances, man, or junior high dance. We would wait for that. I would wait for that song to come on to ask that girl, a certain girl to dance because yeah. it was such That's a great cool. song, so much imagery, especially in music video. It really brings even a, a whole new level to it. The UK, it did well as well. It went to number 36. Huge in New Zealand, went to number two. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> Who knew? Another smash that you and Rachel composed together. Well, it was interesting because in between 18 and Life and I remember you, we put out Piece of Me just as a video. Uh, to sort of bridge the gap and, and give us uh, a bit more time. Uh, because we knew that I remember you would be the be like the last piece to to def to help define what the first record was. Um, so we let we let we did a shot a video that believe it or not John Five is in uh, as a as a youth uh, getting thrown over the hood of a car of a cop car I believe. We did that uh, and then I remember you 
believe it or not, almost didn't make the record. Uh, I've read that. Yeah, it's a true story. Rachel and I had wrote it more as like just to to exercise that songwriting muscle, uh, which you need to do as a songwriter. And like you said, you know, you write a bunch of songs, not all of them are going to make it to the record. So we didn't think that we wanted that song. We were like, ah, it's okay, you know? And the rest of the band and our management were like, you both have lost your minds. That, that song has to be on the record. And we were like, okay, I guess. And it shows you how wrong we were. I mean, it was like the theme to how many proms that year and the year after. Once again, man, being you know innocent and dumb, uh, in, in our youth, you just don't, you just never know. You never I mean, know. Carrie Underwood sings it in concert. She sings it great too, man. You probably know this, but Nora Jones said it was a song that made her want to be a rock star. I had heard that and I couldn't believe that. I had heard that. Like to me like that, I don't even know how to respond to, to like, to such high praise, you know, like it's very, very difficult for me to come to grips with it because at the end of the day, I'm still that 16 year old kid from Sayreville, New Jersey. You know, I still put on my guitar and, and pretend I'm Ace Freely or Joe Perry or, or Randy Rhodes. It's true. Last night, matter of fact, last night I was, I was playing a bunch of Randy Rhodes solos, learning a bunch of his solos. He was one of those heroes. I kid you not. That's what, I, that's what I did last night. That's awesome. We just covered Randy Rhodes the other day. We did a, a tribute to he and Ozzy uh, talking about Crazy Train. Incredible. I mean, talk about losing two of the greatest guitarists ever with Eddie just recently and then uh, Randy Rhodes. I mean, that's one where you just like, man, what would it would he have become? I know because I listened to this stuff, like especially last night when I was like relearning how to play some of that stuff. I, I'm, I'm like, he was 25 years old when he did this. And to think about him being able to play with that sort of proficiency at such a young age, uh, to see, to, to think about the possibility of what he would have become uh, is it's enormous. Uh, but the body of work that he created in such a short period of time, it's, you know, uh, it's second to none. It really is. And it's heartbreaking, man. I remember, you know, he was my guy. Well, it was so avoidable too. That's what was so tragic about it. Yeah. His death was so avoidable and the other people that passed because of the, the guy that was uh, kind of playing a joke when they were kind of swooping over the bus or whatever. It's just so sad. I, it's so sad. It's, it's, it's no, there's no rhyme or reason to that whatsoever. I know. I know. Well, so I remember you. It was such a diverse song for the impact of the song with so many different people because this is a song that opened people that weren't like metal fans to Skid Row, really. I mean, I remember that's when... When the girls were all like, oh, I love Skid Row. I love I Remember You. <laughs> that kind of thing. We had been listening for months. But even though you were leery of the song, I've always read you thought it was a little schmaltzy ballad, which I get. Right. It's such a coming of age hallmark for millions of people that grew up in the late 80s and early 90s. What was the inspiration behind it? Well, like you said, it was just flexing a muscle or was there an actual experience? Uh, well, I mean, I think that I think that we've all gone through experiences of, of relationships that have uh, have failed, if you will. Um, and we were at such an early age where we had experienced our own youthful heartbreak as well. We all have. That's it's kind of a uh, something that occurs universally uh, to to all of us, where you just you, your heart gets broken. Um, and you, you yearn for that, for that feeling of of, of someone else again, uh, again being so youthful at that time. Uh, it was it's kind of put into the simplest form that we knew how, uh, telling a story again, 
not knowing if we were going to reach anybody, just hoping that, well, we didn't even want to put it on the record initially. <laughs> yeah. But we just wanted to tell a story uh, that was that came from our, our, our gut. Uh, and that was, we had both experienced, you know, uh, relationships that we thought, you know, at, your, at an early age, when you meet that first love of your life, you think that that's going to be the be all that ends all. And then when it ends, you're like, oh man, it just, it crushes you. <laughs> yeah. How am I going to go on? Exactly. And so, you know, that happened, that happened to all of us more than once. And so we just were taking that experience and putting it into, into, uh, music in a lyrical form. Not speaking of anyone in particular, just our life experience uh, inspiring uh, that whole thing. Um, and then the response that we got from when we released it was, uh, when we put it on a record, the way it came out was such a, uh, a eye-opening experience, I think, to both Rachel and I, that once we we realized that we needed to put it on the record, uh, everybody's performances on that song are just, they're amazing. In fact, let's talk about that for a second, because sure. I feel like when I say power ballad on steroids, I mean, this is something where you guys kind of mess with it a little bit. You have the acoustic guitar coming in there, and, and honestly, uh, Snake, I hear a little uh, over the hills and far away in the intro. Oh, wow. Now that I've never heard before, and I appreciate that. While I loved Led Zeppelin, it wasn't a huge influence on me. Uh, so I was just, to be honest with you, man, I was just, I remember when I first started writing it, I was, the music, I was strumming these, just these chords in my bedroom at my mom's house. And Scotty was living with me at the time. And I went upstairs and played it for Scotty. I go, check out this thing. It's kind of like a, like a John Cougar, Bruce Springsteen type of thing. <laughs> and so when Rachel and I got together to write, He's like, you know, well, we would sit there. Our process is, is like, well, what do you got? Well, like, what, what ideas do you have? Do you have uh, musical ideas? Do you have lyric ideas? Do you have melody ideas? Uh, and then we just take it from there. We don't have like a structured way of doing anything. So we started we started writing it on the on the back porch of his mother's house. I just uh, and also in the in the bedroom upstairs at his parents' house. Was it pouring rain? <laughs> Uh, I believe the the one night that we started writing the lyrics, I believe that it was. Because you can totally feel that ambiance, and everybody influences everybody. That's what I love, especially in the times of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. It felt like it was this potpourri of just all this different kind of music, and you talking about all the music that you grew up on. I love it when you can hear that, because even in this song, like, um, Love Letters in the Sand... That's a little bit, it kind of feels like the 1950s because there's a song, the song Love Letters in the Sand. Writing love letters. Right. It's just cool to bring all that together in this cool thing. But when you say, um, woke up to the sound, Sebastian sings, woke up to the sound of pouring rain, the wind will whisper and I think of you and all the tears you cried. And then you guys just bust it, man. That, that's why I mean a power ballad on steroids, because you start at the acoustic, then you go to that huge knockout punch, but then you come right back down. That's what really, yeah, really cool about that. Yeah, again, the dynamics. You know, that's, that's from that education of music growing up. You know, just the, the, the power of dynamics. Well, and I love the bluesy guitar line, too, after you say... We spent the summer with the top rolled down. Ah, I mean, thank you. That was just cool stuff that you didn't hear in your regular kind of middle of the road power ballad that was such a big thing in the 80s. And the beautiful, it's got a beautiful bridge. Oh, thank you. Amazing solo. Yeah, it was great solo. Scotty Hill again, great solo.
like the heaviest I can remember from a power ballad. Yeah, you know what's funny is that that's the beauty of of Scotty's solo is that you can hum that solo. Uh, same thing with 18 and Life, you can hum that solo. Like it's again, it's a story within a story. Well, and then back to the acoustic, return to the pour and rain part, which is very cinematic. How it, you hear it at the first part, and then you come back in the end. Sebastian at the end there, man, those notes that yeah. he hits. Wow. I mean, when especially at the end there when he's just like the last I remember you and he just In the studio, you guys had to know when that was when all that was coming together that this was a hit song or what did you think? Again, you're you're in. You, I, I couldn't tell you a hit song if it smacked me in the face. It, <laughs> you know? I mean, especially our own stuff. It's it's so difficult to be objective when it's with your own stuff. You you have uh, you're there's this there's this nature to protect it uh, from any sort of negativity. You know, like don't you mess with our song. I don't want to <laughs> hear anything bad about it. You know. <laughs> And and so that, that when when we were writing the whole record, like I said, there was a lot of songs that didn't make it, and uh, that would be hard on on my own personal psyche, my my protective nature of what we created, uh, that it wouldn't make uh, the record, that it wasn't quote unquote good enough. So when we were, when we recorded it, we knew it was good. Uh, but you don't have, there's, there's, you don't have that response yet. You don't like, you don't know. We had other people telling us how good it was, but you still just don't know. Uh, you only hope, you only hope. Well, you had to know that, I mean, with Sebastian, I know that in other interviews bringing this up, but we don't ever talk about this. I don't really care about the whole, we don't want to talk about the, this kind of thing. We really like to talk about the music, but nothing can ever be denied um, of the music that you guys all made together in that moment. It's just magic. Yeah, I think that you're right. I think that, that uh, Michael Wagner was able to capture something uh, and pull something out of us that I don't know if we knew we even had within us. And that's, that was the, uh, that was kind of the whole sensibility around that whole record was, you know, again, being really youthful and, and ignorant and uh, kind of uh, oblivious, really. Thank you. That's a great word. Oblivious, <laughs> to, oblivious to the world at large. We were not yet. We were not yet world travelers. We were. Uh, uh, we we're culturally ignorant. Uh, so we we're just going on pure emotion. And. Uh, for that song to have the impact that it eventually had was, I think it took us all by surprise as I think, it, I think all, at least for, for, for me, uh, you, you can sit there and go, well, it sounds like it could do well. Like it's, it sounds like people would play this, but you just don't know. You just don't know. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not of that mindset. Like, Oh, this thing is going to be a huge smash. I know it because I don't know. I just don't. Uh, never. Nobody did. knows anything, as as many people have said when they're being truly honest. Right. Right. It's like um, everybody always asks the questions of a lot of bands. Are you guys going to get back together? And I look at it like this. I look at it like I don't really care about that as much as I care about the music they did make because that. That's etched in stone. I'm really, really proud of, of our history. I, I don't lament the past, uh, but I'm very, very proud of everything that we've created from day one to now. That doesn't change. So uh, I'm not one to be uh, deny our past in any way whatsoever. I'm, I'm uh, incredibly proud of what I've been a part of. Uh, all of it is extremely humbling. Uh all the all the hills and valleys, man. Uh, all of it. Because uh, you learned something from all of it. Absolutely, 
and it, it, it helps, you know, it helps shape who you are. Uh, I was raised in an environment where, you know, you don't take anything for granted. Uh, success is not a birthright. It's a, it's a gift and a privilege if it happens to occur. Uh, and, and, and I was always, uh, I use this word often because it's the truth. I was always, always been humbled by it. Uh, which I think, which is what helped me deal with when we not, were not as popular at one point uh, as, as we were. And I think that helped me deal with that in, in a way that was like, look, man, this is just, that's, this is life. And be thankful for what you've been given and be thankful that you're able to do this for a living and to be able to create uh, as, as a musician. Uh, and that stuck, again, that sticks with me. Uh, Cause that's the basis of who I am. Again, as I stated earlier, I'm that kid to this day. I'm that kid, man. you know, pretending I'm, I'm, I'm Eddie or Randy Rose or, or, you know, Joe Perry. <laughs> Ace Freely. I'm still that kid. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Snake and about Skid Row and this incredible song. Share a memory about the song, what it means to you. Do you remember when it was played at the school dances? I sure do. To get more of this interview and many others, click on our Patreon link below. Tell you if this content resonates with you, we invite you to subscribe. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.